the task force herewith loses its leader. Soon it will lose its main citadel as well. Seeing the Admiral depart for his private quarters, his adjutant, Lieutenant Commander Ishida, nimbly follows in his steps. Because it has been his job from beginning to end to wait on the Admiral, he wishes also to share his death. Instantly, with one bound, the Chief of Staff grabs him firmly from behind. The adjutant, two or three rungs down the ladder, bent on hurrying down. The Chief of Staff, one powerful hand grasping the adjutant by the belt, the other gripping the railing, teeth clenched and entire face flushed. Neither says a word, and for several seconds they are deadlocked. You don't have to go. Don't be a fool. Groaning in a low voice, the Chief of Staff. To withstand the full strength of the young adjutant must be an enormous strain. The adjutant is surely the stronger of the two, but perhaps he loses heart in the face of the sincerity of the Chief of Staff. With face averted, he finally yields. With the same force with which he pulled him back up onto the bridge, the Chief of Staff now pushes him violently away. Fortunately, both Chief of Staff and Adjutant returned alive from the mission. The two of them, I hear, having learned that things were not going well after the war for the Admiral's bereaved family, which had lost both its men, contributed thereafter to its support in so far as each was able. I encounter Ensign Matsumoto at the rear of the bridge. His face pale, he points with his finger and whispers, For us too, it's only a matter of time, isn't it? He is pointing toward the stern at the aft weather deck, the topmost deck, highest above water level. From the port, the side to which the ship lists, waves lap at the deck, and a run of waves washes it. That aft weather deck, praised as a floating castle, with waves striking the deck, it is already impossible to avoid capsizing. Is he shuddering at this proof that our situation is hopeless? Gentle-hearted poet Ensin Matsumoto. Has he already fallen victim to his own keen susceptibilities? His post is on the second bridge several flights down, so he probably came up from there seeking companionship. Did he expect me to be optimistic? He should be undaunted no matter how adverse the conditions. Did he come seeking words of encouragement? At this point I still do not dream that Yamato's final gasp is near. My mind has realised long since that the end is near, but my emotions, a different matter, blaze up, irrationally. Is it because of the severe strain that has gone on so long? Or have I been bewitched by the magnificence of this giant ship? All giant things have about them a mystique that captivates all those affiliated and instills in them an absolute trust and affection. Those still alive on the bridge number no more than ten. Some are in a great hurry to try and escape. They are all veteran officers, captains, commanders and lieutenant commanders. Crawling along the ladder, which is canted almost to water level, they turn their heads and cast furtive glances at us. Where are they going, leaving their posts? Can there be a more appropriate place to die? Let those who leave, leave. But can it be that at this rare opportunity, this moment between life and death, they feel in their hearts not the slightest remorse? Fortunately, at this point, the rest of us are content with our lot. Something to be grateful for. Around me, it becomes quieter and quieter. Though there is no let-up in the sounds of destruction hastening the end of the fighting, I am oblivious. Only a gentle silence touches my ears. Everything I see shines with a white light. I gaze in wonder, as if my eyes were seeing things for the first time. Have my eyes become crystal clear to their very depths? Space comes to a stop before me. Time freezes around me. I am I and yet not I. Barely a few instants, this interval. Again the voice from inside my chest presses me, virtually out loud. You, I pity you, finally given in to death. You who are dying. What have you made of yourself? Think, do you have anything at all to be proud of? Hold on, you. Wait, please wait. My brief life has had its blessings. Warm ties to my parents, wonderful teachers and friends, a pleasant environment, rich hopes, not inconsiderable talents. That's enough for me. I'm happy. The voice. Which of those represents the real you? Apart from all those, is there anything else that you would take with you? If there is, out with it. No, those are not the only things. There are others, glittering, unfading. The voice, tell me about them. Those many memories, beautiful ones, free of all regrets. The voice, are they true memories? Ah, what is it, this uneasiness? Why this impatience? The voice, well then, have you known the joys and sorrows that come from being modest? Have you bowed your head in true humility? Ah, modesty, I'm a proud one, please forgive me. 
Still, allow me to reply that I acted once and once only in a way that I believe was almost modest. The voice, was that true humility? Humility in the face of what? How did you show it? I cannot stand this self-questioning. Indignantly, cut it out. Don't cross-examine me. I'll be the judge of myself. The voice with a derisive laugh, judge yourself. Ha, you fool. Judging yourself even as you are being engulfed in the stench of death. Still deceiving yourself even at this late hour? Leave me alone. Don't take this last brief moment of ease too from me. I'm sinking. Where am I going? Please kill me. Rescue me from this fathomless terror. Kill me. The captain. How about the portrait of his majesty? From the man in charge, Hattori, chief of the 9th division, comes a hastily written response delivered by messenger. That he has the imperial portrait in his quarters and has locked the door from the inside. There is no surer way than this to protect it with his life. I see the navigation officer and the assistant navigation officer face each other and bind themselves together. Knees rubbing and shoulders touching, they attempt to bind each other's legs and hips to the binnacle. Not only would it be a matter for shame if by any chance they should float to the surface, but it is also a physiological fact that if they were thrown into the water with their arms and legs free, they would struggle to reach the surface. Should that happen, the anguish would be too much for them to bear. Seeing them, I too naturally reach for my side, touching the line readied some time ago. That such might be the end of a special attack was something we fully foresaw. What are you doing, you young ones, swim? Chief of Staff Morishita strikes a threatening pose, lacing his angry words with blows of his fists. He hits me from the side. I have no choice but to follow his orders, and changing my mind, throw away the line. Still, my resentment does not go away. Grinding my teeth, I glare around me. If we try to get away now, what has been the purpose of this special attack mission? Why the line with which to end our lives? The truth of the matter. Several minutes earlier, in that final conference to which the staff crawled its way, the commander-in-chief had given the order, Stop the mission! Turn back after rescuing the men! Close to them, though we were, we didn't know. On the flag deck of Yamato, now little more than a skeletal structure, signal flags to that effect were hoisted immediately. The emergency beacon on Yamato's main tower desperately signalled again and again to the destroyers on either side, move in closer, move in closer. Yet the destroyers did not close us, fearing either the currents that would follow our sinking or the shock waves from the accompanying explosions. Had they come alongside, there can be no doubt they would have been dashed to pieces along with Yamato. On seeing the signal to close us, the captain of Fuyutsuki is said to have flown into a towering rage. He refused to countenance the report of his senior officer that they were ready to come alongside to rescue the men and steamed off in the opposite direction. He must have resented fiercely the fact that the change in plans was so cowardly, the sudden shift from the headlong rush of the special attack to miscarriage and flight homeward. The staff officers who fled the bridge in great haste a moment ago had seen, shining toward them, a single ray of hope for survival. Having heard with their own ears the decision to turn back, they acted so as to prolong their lives. Had we too been privy to that order, what would we have done? Would we have been able to endure calmly the inner turmoil? Ours was the reckless valour of ignorance. Those who take heart on seeing life beckoning turn weak. Those who offer themselves up, seeing no life beckoning, turn strong. Still, it was a resolute act, Admiral Ito's order to abandon the mission. Of his comrades on the road to death, half were gone. For the desperate mission, there was no hope. The journey, too, was half over, and there was just enough fuel to get home if he turned back now. The very last chance to act, a situation permitting no procrastination. What extraordinary resolve. At the time, 100 million deaths rather than surrender was a popular slogan. Nevertheless, acting on his own initiative, he called a halt to this special attack mission on which so much had been staked. One might say that in the end he carried out his original aim, for from first to last he had been stubbornly opposed to the mission. Vice Admiral Ito, who at the time the war started, was already in the important post of Vice Chief of the Naval General Staff. Since then, he had been responsible for devising the strategy of all the important naval battles, and had mourned the loss of countless vessels and men. 
It must have been his cherished ambition to die in the line of duty as commander of the last task force sent into battle by the Imperial Navy. The commander-in-chief's sole concern undoubtedly lay in the consistency of his judgment on the merits of the mission's goal and of his execution of the plan. He staked everything on his firm adherence to this one point. The horizon stands at right angles to the narrow lookout ports, chops my range of vision into two parts, black and white, presses in on me. List, 80 degrees. Over the voice tube, a message from a code officer. The code books have been attended to. He has taken all the classified documents in his arms, has entered the code room on the bridge, and has locked it from the inside. The code books, so designed as to make it impossible for them to fall into enemy hands. Sheets of lead are attached to the covers of the books to make doubly sure the books sink. What is more, the codes are printed with a special ink that dissolves on contact with seawater. On top of that, a second strong impression is made with a matrix of different type to eliminate any physical imprint left by the type. And still the code officers must protect the top secret codes with their lives. The captain repeats the order, All hands on deck! The captain's messenger transmits it orally to each division, so few still alive. It was clear that it was already too late, but measures had been taken against sinking, and the captain hoped to save even a single life, and more if possible. Ah, at that moment did even one sailor take this order to mean, all hands, prepare to abandon ship? The desperate battle developed halfway to our destination on this most funereal special attack mission ever. At its close, did anyone have even the slightest expectation of surviving? Furthermore, the men in Yamato had no way of knowing that the mission had already been cancelled for the other ships, that it had been decided to rescue the men and head for home. All hands, prepare to die. Wasn't that the only order we expected to hear? We knew intuitively that on deck meant to assemble on deck for a final standing at attention at quarters, prepared for death. Even if the end of Yamato did not come within the next few hours, we had used up, more than half our fuel, and there was not enough left to make it back. There was nothing for the survivors but to make a furious dash at the enemy. In any case, the order to rescue the men came too late. I saw several of the hatches scattered on the forward deck open from inside and men race up and out, but now the water covers the area like a smooth cloth and pours down the hatches. The bridge is already just a dark chamber lying on its side. Two volumes of operation documents fallen from somewhere. Without thinking, I pick them up and put them away in the chart stand. Around me, all at once, I see no one. The command, all hands on deck, manipulating the exhausted survivors like puppets, has lured them to leave the bridge. My post? Should I leave it? The bridge, a capital place to die. Nothing left for me to do here. These twenty square metres of space to which I have entrusted my fate, to live or to die for these two hours. For a moment, an involuntary restlessness. As if possessed by something, I stick my fingers in the grating of the deck and clamber up onto the lookout stand. Some guy ahead of me kicks me, and I roll off onto the bottom of the bridge, but grumbling. Here I go again. I crawl up onto it once more. Behind me, a cheerful voice. OK, I'm bringing up the rear. Ensign Watanabe, communications officer. He was stationed on the bridge in place of the wounded Ensign Nishio. As a result, he is lucky and survives. The last to escape from the bridge, he reports that when he had climbed halfway out the port, he and the ship were engulfed together by the water. He went through the window, he says, as if blown out by the pressure of air or water. He was thrown into the sea. Wriggling through the port, I look back almost longingly, poor bridge on its side and completely dark, surprisingly narrow, burrow-like. Their bodies lashed together, the navigation officer and the assistant navigation officer reject a second and third time our exhortations to escape. They shrug off their shoulders the hands of their fellow officers. I watch until the end. Both have their eyes wide open and stare fixedly at the water rising toward them. Thus the end of Commander Mogi and Lieutenant Hanada. Is the responsibility of running the ship so great? Even now, vivid in my memory, the voice of Ensign Mori, an aide attached to the captain, continuing to shout encouragement, and the sight of him thumping the sailors on the shoulders with a swagger stick, right up to the moment of sinking. For him who never did take off his steel helmet and flak jacket, it is an admirable end. Because we were posted on the enclosed part of the bridge, 
we had no such protective gear. To go into the water still wearing such gear makes it impossible to stay afloat for any length of time. I crawl out the lookout port and stand on the starboard bulkhead of the bridge. The survivors are lined up on the brownish belly of the ship, a distant 30 or 40 metres away, all with hands raised in unison. They must just have finished three shouts of Banzat. In a small cluster and moving as one, they look like toy soldiers. My heart goes out to them. The last moments of Rear Admiral Ariga Kosaku, captain of Yamato. In the anti-aircraft command post on the very top of the bridge, still wearing his helmet and flak jacket, he binds himself to the binnacle. Having completed the final dispositions, the code books, the command for all hands to come on deck and so on, yi, he shouts Banzai three times. On finishing, he turns to look at the four surviving lookouts standing by his side. They are too devoted to this resolute, ruddy-faced captain to be able to leave him. Seeing a resolve to die together crystallising among them, he slaps each on the shoulder, encourages them to keep their spirits up, and pushes them off into the water. The final sailor presses his last four biscuits into the captain's hands, as if to show his innermost feelings. The captain takes them with a grin. As he has the second one in his mouth, he is engulfed along with the ship. To eat biscuits at such a time, iron nerves without equal. Thus the words of the chief lookout. He too was unable to leave the captain's side. In the end, he was thrown into the water while standing right next to the captain, but not having lashed himself down, he floated to the surface. Fluttering atop the main mast, the great battle ensign is about to touch the water. As I watch, a young sailor comes forward and clambers up to the base of the mast. Would he serve the battle ensign, soul of this sinking giant? No one could have ordered him to do so, so he has chosen this glorious duty. How proud his death! It seems foolish to think such thoughts now, but when I drop my glance to the hull of the ship towering above the water and to its exposed undersides, it looks like a great whale. That this vast piece of metal, 270 metres long and 40 metres wide, is about to plunge beneath the waves. I recognise near me many shipmates. That fellow and that one. This one's eyebrows are very dark, that one's ears very pale. All of them have childlike expressions on their faces. Better, they are all completely without expression. For each of them, it must be a moment of absolute innocence, an instant of complete obliviousness. For all I know, I too am in the same condition. At what do they gaze with ecstatic eyes? The eddies, extending as far as they can see. The boiling waves, interlocking in a vast pattern. Pure white and transparent, like ice congealing around this giant ship and propping her up. And the sound of the waves, deafening our ears, induces still deeper rapture. We see a sheet of white. We hear only the thundering of the turbulent waters. Are we sinking? For the first time, as if on fire, I ask myself that question. The spectacle is so mysterious, so resplendent, that I am overcome with the premonition that something extraordinary is about to happen. The water already begins to creep up on the starboard half of the ship. Bodies flying in all directions, it is not simply a matter of being swallowed by the waves. The pressure of the water boiling up sends bodies flying like projectiles. The bodies become mere grey dots and scatter in all directions, effortlessly, happily. Even as I watch, a whirlpool runs fifty metres in one swoop, and spray springs up at my feet, water contorted as in a funhouse mirror, gleaming in countless angles, countless formations, glitters before my nose. In multiple mirrors, the water engulfs human figures. Some pop back up, some hang upside down in the water. This exquisite glass design colours the uniform white of the foam, as do stripes of pure blue scattered all over this blanket of bubbles. The effect of the churning created by the many eddies? Just as my heart delights for a moment in this beauty, this gracefulness, I am swept into a large whirlpool. Without thinking, I draw as deep a breath as I can, Grabbing my feet and rolling up into a ball like a baby in the womb, I brace myself and do my utmost to avoid being injured. But the snarling whirlpool is so strong it almost wrenches off my arms and legs. Tossed up, thrown down, beaten, torn limb from limb, I think. O oh world, seen with half an eye at the last moment. Even twisted and upended, how alluring your form. How exquisite your colours. This mental image flitting past is welcome solace for my suffocating breast. Not one person managed to swim far enough away in time to escape this whirlpool. They say that with a great ship like this one, 
The danger zone has a radius of 300 metres. The decision to save the men came too late and robbed us of the margin of time needed to swim that distance. All hands dead in battle. This has become our fate. Now Yamato's list is virtually 90 degrees. Such instances are rare. Most ships sink when the list reaches 30 degrees. Because of the 90 degree list, the shells for the main batteries fall over in the magazines, slide in the direction of their pointed ends, knock their fuses on the overhead and explode. This reconstruction of events was agreed upon at a staff conference of the officers after our return. The staff officers recognized that at the time no fire could have reached the magazines. The ship is already completely underwater. I am in the whirlpool. There is a full load of shells for the main batteries, armor-piercing shells, one round of which can sink a ship, and Type 3 shells, one round of which can knock out a squadron of planes. First, the four magazine explodes. Twenty seconds after the ship went under, had it happened before the sinking, with the ship still on the surface, the explosion would have turned us outright into shrapnel and scattered us in all directions. But the water even while toying with us, deadened its force. Had there been no explosion, I would have sunk rapidly in the whirlpool to the bottom of the sea. At the instant Yamato, rolling over, turns belly up and plunges beneath the waves, she emits one great flash of light and sends a gigantic pillar of flame high into the dark sky. Armour plate, equipment, turrets, guns, all the pieces of the ship go flying off. Moreover, thick smoke, dark brown and bubbling up from the ocean depths, soon engulfs everything, covers everything. The navigation officer on one of the destroyers calculated that the pillar of fire reached a height of 2,000 metres, that the mushroom-shaped cloud rose to a height of 6,000 metres. Newspapers reported afterward that the flash of light could be seen easily from Kagoshima. Opening out like an umbrella, the top of the pillar of light engulfs and destroys several American planes, circling to observe the end. In the general explosion, the shells for the main batteries, carried below decks but of no use because of the bad weather, do get their shot at the enemy. The pressure generated by the explosion of the four magazine alone is not equal to that of the whirlpool. While being tossed about in the whirlpool, my whole body absorbs the extraordinary concussion of the shock wave from the first explosion. I am thrust back, around and up, crashing into a thick yet undulating wall overhead. This wall, the corpses of comrades who surfaced quickly and are now being baptised in the fiery rain. Did they shield us with their bodies from the arrows of fire? Meanwhile, the whirlpool still has enough force to pull us back down again, away from the surface. Then, about twenty seconds later, the second explosion. Perhaps part of the aft magazine? This blast finally hurls my body up to the surface. The repeated explosions send countless pieces of shrapnel flying. Did the shrapnel turn all the men into living targets, save only those few of us on the aft side of the main tower? Again, we alone were able to avoid fearsome injury from the underwater explosions. To think that we who stayed put on the bridge and stuck close to the ship's superstructure should be protected time and again and be safest of all. As for those who left before us and neared the deck, the nearer they were, the more exposed they were to the blasts. What an irony. Even so, everyone among us is at least slightly wounded. Most have injuries to head and feet. Only those whose wounds were slight were able to survive the hardships to follow. I receive a long burn wound and a cut on the top left of my head. According to the examination carried out later by the medical officer, the fragment of shrapnel must have been pretty large, and chances were that the injury would have been a fatal one. But because it hit my head at a tangent, I narrowly escaped death. It hit me while I was being tossed about as if by a hurricane, this being so how tiny the probability that the piece of shrapnel and I should collide at a tangent. To be born a human being and yet to owe my life to the fact that something hit me tangentially. Should I laugh? A great number of men must have been sucked under by the funnel. Fearsome, it's suction. A great cavity sucks up a vast amount of water and with it any solid object. After we got back, the survivors were asked to mark on a diagram where they were when they entered the water. In the vicinity of the funnel, a large blank space. Had I been five paces to the right, I would have been in danger. The pillar of fire blows straight back down. The sky is filled with red-hot shrapnel and pieces of wood falling with a roar. The debris kills or wounds most of the men who struggled to float to the surface but got there too soon. 
only those of us who float up at the last, after having taken the roundabout route through the whirlpool, escape that and do not see a scorching hot sky. Instead, we see only dense smoke. Those who came to the surface a few moments earlier than we looked up as in a daze at countless pieces of metal falling out of a blazing orange sky. Caught up in the whirlpool, my body suffered great torment. By comparison, how trivial the thoughts that flooded my mind. There was still a good bit of soda left in that bottle, and I've still got five packets of candy late, isn't it? From a quick look at the charts, I know the ocean in this area is 430 metres deep. At this speed, how long before I sink to the bottom? What does it feel like to drop 430 metres? And, and then? Finally, still with only the one deep breath, I approach my limit. Perhaps ten seconds after the shock from the second explosion, the agonising pressure on my chest rises sharply. At last my throat seizes, and suddenly I start to swallow seawater. Through my nose, through my mouth, I breathe in seawater as if poured in by a pump. Unconsciously my body registers the movements of my jaw. Seventeen, fifteen, seventeen. Still, I have no sense of suffocating. Am I unable to die until water fills all the nooks and crannies of my body and spills out my mouth? Is the piece of death still far off? Kill me. Death, take me. The edges of my eyes register a dim light. The backs of my eyelids are yellowish. In my nostrils a burnt smell surges up. My feet feel light. Everything is hazy as in a dream, and my body floats in space. No sooner do I think these thoughts than I break through the surface of the water. Had the second explosion come even five seconds later, my lungs would have burst. It would have been all over with me. Only those survived who were delayed on a circuitous route just long enough to avoid the falling pillar of fire, and yet were thrust to the surface before their lungs burst. Lieutenant Watanabe. The darkness turned bright, so I heaved a sigh of relief. Hooray! It's the next world! Cadet Sako. I'm not sure, but I think I said two prayers to Amida. Strange. I've never been one to pray. To think that if even one element of this repeated good fortune had been lacking, we would not have seen the light of day again. Cut off by the water, the smoke gradually clears away only to leave behind waves covered with bubbly heavy oil. Yamato sinks, 14.23 hours. Friend and foe flash the message simultaneously. Two hours of uninterrupted battle against airplanes. It's over now. The heavy oil smarts and my eyes won't open. Catching my breath, I prise open my eyes, clean out my ears and float for several minutes. Gradually it registers that I am still among the living, not in the realm of the dead. Damn. Have I floated to the surface? To live again? A light rain falls upon the water as I do battle with heavy oil, cold sweeping fire of machine guns, loss of blood, sharks, very close to me, waves shining the colour of ash, the rough oceans swell viscous with heavy oil, a layer of muck like oil, a coating of bubbles, drifting bits of wood, men singing to keep up their spirits, voices sound far and near not in unison, men panting at the weight of their own bodies, men groaning with pain, probably the badly wounded. Because the heavy oil turns everything a uniform black, we can't tell even red blood. Some poor men go mad and sink. Swallowing oil has physiological effects. Their shouts sound like laughter indeed, like the shrill voices of girls. Those who thrash about too much disappear in the twinkling of an eye, the prey of hungry sharks attracted by their movements. Many men use up their energy and drown. Many young sailors seem with their last breaths to call out their love for their mothers. Then, with both hands raised as if trying in vain to grasp the sky, they go under and are gone. A hoarse voice sounds across the water. Any one of warrant officer rank or better, stay where you are and report your names. Take charge of the men around you and stand by. Make preparations for staying afloat. The one doing the shouting seen from the side, Assistant Gunnery Officer Shimizu, Right, I am an officer, albeit not much of one. Take charge of the sailors. Gather together as many as possible. Wait for the next step. Why have I been so absent-minded? Will there ever be a better time to do my duty? Lifting my voice and waving my arm, I report my name. Sailors whose faces are hard to tell apart slowly make their way through the waves and gather. I herd about ten into a group and make them wait quietly. 
I try to do as we have rehearsed, using our leggings to tie a raft together to accommodate the wounded, but the explosion of the ship has blown all the wood into small pieces. None is long enough to make a raft. Each of us must gather several bits of wood for himself, squeeze them under his arms or between his legs, and try for dear life to stay afloat. Holding them between our fingers doesn't work because our fingers quickly go numb. I open my eyes, stinging from the heavy oil. I pursue something over the ocean swells as if possessed. What is it? None other than an apparition of Yamato, that great hulk of metal, dark grey and towering into the sky. All of us treading water pursue it with an insatiable tenacity. Has it made me so fearful, so lonely, the disappearance of that which these feet of mine trod, that which supported my body? Yamato, support of my life now gone, only bubbles, bubbles, the strafing fire of machine guns, planes that skim past, hugging the water, carefree, belts of bullet tracks that thread splashes into the face of the water, Paradoxically, a pretty sight when the belts intersect. Terror, not terror. Why do the bullets steer clear of us? Very strange. The faces, the heads near me, jet black, monstrous, like balls of charcoal the size of cantaloupes. A smile bubbles up from within me. They are so comic, but I bite my lip and suppress the grin. Then suddenly rage wells up within me. Spitting out the anger on the tip of my tongue and hissing, I glare around me, I'm soaked all the way to my underwear. Teeth chattering, I groan with the cold. I ball my fists and strike them together. I am aware of only two things. My unreasoning anger and the cold. The piece of chair which I have been holding onto for dear life is forever submerging and causing me to swallow large amounts of water. I'm having too hard a time of it, and so I let it go. It sinks immediately. Had seawater already soaked into all the straw of the cushion and increased its weight? Holding on to it was as stupid as holding on to a lead sinker. Good going. I try to speak aloud and encourage myself, but my voice catches in my throat, and all that happens is that my temples vibrate a bit. When, of necessity, I turn to look for new pieces of wood, I meet the glance of a sailor nearby. He has eyes like a fish, timid and nervous. Don't worry, I won't steal your chance to survive. Why should I pick on you? Muttering these words, I swim away from him. Bobbing up and down in the water, I finally grab hold of several small pieces of wood. With the pieces clamped under my arms, I look back. He is still twisting his body to face me, peering at me hatefully. When I take a good steady look at him, I recognise the face. A radio man I know. A boy. What could cause so great a change in the face of one so young? Such resentment, such loathing. Yet we are shipmates. Are they so strong? The grudges and the distrust sailors feel toward officers, even for a boy so naive? Something presses up on my chest. To endure the pain I tense up my toes as I tread water. To die of cold, I think, must be just like falling asleep, deep and easy. So my present futile struggling must lead soon to that easy death. All I need do is just wait like this for drowsiness to overtake me. So be it. But what to do about the oil-smeared eyes, the panting mouths, the exasperated tenacity of the sailors gathered here in a flock? It is only natural, of course, that they should struggle. Individual human beings engrossed in their own lives and in nothing else. Their true character is laid bare. Coward that I am, I try to escape, into my own thoughts. All I can hope is that when the time comes, I die a good death. Intent, I spur myself on in this way. Something occurs to me. Apart from right now, will there ever come a precious moment when I can hear the music of the spheres? I should be able to. If I am now absolutely receptive, I should be able to. Surely I can experience a single incomparable moment. Nothing. A silence like that of death. In that case, haven't I some music of my own? My love of music, my conceit. Was that all a lie? Wait. What is it I heard just now that just came alive in my breast? Yes, of course, a theme of Bach. The theme from the unaccompanied sonata, familiar to my ear, sustenance to my heart. Wrong. It's not real. A hallucination, isn't it? No, don't let thoughts lead you astray. Don't think. Just be your true self. As suits you, be afraid, lament, rejoice. Had I known then that I had some chance of surviving, would I have been so tranquil? Wouldn't I have fought, struggled for the slightest possibility of surviving, thrashed obstinately until my strength was spent? 
Look, someone smiling in my direction. Leading Seaman Noro with his boyish, indeed girlish face. He was never under my direct command. But several times on the bridge I used him to transmit messages. A model sailor, he, intelligent, conscientious, outstanding. Dark pieces of wood bob up and down in the water about his chubby cheeks. In his mouth, opening in a smile, the slight gleam of his teeth. The expression on his face, appearing and disappearing in the waves, is without doubt a smile. The affection. The bliss. He is kind enough to delight in my escaping the whirlpool. He gives his blessing to the fact that we have set out together to swim the rough seas of this existence. Eyes inflamed by oil, a smile selfless and innocent. Captivated, I smile in response. I let up treading water, and in the next instant I get a face full of wave. Tears come to my eyes, tears overflow, and I turn away, ducking my nose into the oil. How unseemly that the two of us together in the grasp of death should so revel in the rich bliss of life. Still, to share a smile at such a time? What a feeling! Are they tears of satisfaction? Tears of relief that I have not yet lost a heart that can smile? When the tears clear away, he is gone. A destroyer advances toward us at full speed. Judging from its design, Fuyutsuki, we watch closely for a bit, and indeed the prow is headed precisely in our direction. If she holds to this course, we will surely become fodder for her propellers. Even while doubting that there is any point in getting out of its way, since we probably won't be rescued anyway, I lead the men slowly out of the destroyer's path. At the moment of closest approach, she turns hard to one side, and the stern makes a wide swing to the left, ploughing its way through the very middle of a group of floating men. It soaks them in its powerful wake and slides away. We are in the middle of the downslope of the towering wake. With all of us holding on to one another, we fight the undertow. Those who are several metres away from us, on the ship's side of the crest of the wake, are sucked into the demonic whirlpool created by the propellers. Drowned, every last one of them. The destroyer signals repeatedly with five handheld flags. Has she put all her signalmen to work? Hold on a bit. A bullet fells a signalman at his task, and another man immediately takes his place. Hold on a bit. Hold on for what? Take heart. Will they pick up those of us in the water, use us to fill out the complement of the ships and return to the attack? The sailors who follow me are so immersed in their own lives that their eyes do not see, the flags do not register, jostling each other, they are engaged in singing military songs. I put an end to that. Scolding them, I wait for what is to come. Rescue. The destroyer makes one circuit of the men in the water and comes to a stop. Although the enemy attack is over, planes are still to be seen. Stopping constitutes a real danger. The ship can stop for only the briefest time. Will we be able to swim to her? Measured by the eye, the distance from here is 200 metres. Keeping the impatient ones in check, we advance in a group, pushing our pieces of wood. Must not rush things. The alerts day and night, the two hours of fierce fighting. Now the time in the water. Our physical strength has already been pushed to the limit. If we race, devoting all our remaining strength to the task, we will collapse when we get there. That much is clear. That is the lesson of past battles too numerous to mention. The hems of our rain gear coiling around us, the weight of our high-top boots, the cumbersomeness of our leggings, the oil forming a thick layer on the surface of the water, like thrashing around in honey. Moreover, 200 metres to swim while husbanding our strength. If I can't get the men to follow me in this ticklish manoeuvre, what kind of officer am I? The question crosses my mind. How much time has passed since we entered the water? Barely 20 minutes? To go by how I feel, less than 30 minutes at the very most. But in fact, nearly three hours have passed since the ship blew up. Dusk is already settling on the ocean. It would be natural for these abominable hours to seem longer than in fact they were. Why is it that they seemed on the contrary much shorter? Was it that staying afloat is completely mindless and fatiguing, that my sense of time is too fragile and I was simply oblivious of the minutes as they passed? The sight of the rocking ship burns itself onto our eyes to the point of hurting. Aching with intense desire, we arrive at last at the side of the ship. We stop swimming, and my limbs are totally exhausted. All at once, perhaps because I have swallowed much oil, I feel feverish. Chills rack me. Throw a line to desperate men, and you see humanity stripped naked. The oil becomes ever thicker. 
Heavy waves strike against the ship and bounce back. Chills and flashes of fever run up and down my spine. Looking up in search of people, in search of voices, I am impatient beyond bearing. O oh, unfeeling ship, would that your sides were vertical. But your hull is a wall towering over us, slanting outward pitilessly, almost covering us over. Bitter despair fills me. My eyes smart in the oil, and already I sense a paralysis in my lower limbs. There are perhaps three lines hanging over the side. Smeared with oil, they all glisten. The many hands, too, covered with oil, glisten. Individuals fighting among themselves to be first. Oil rubbing against oil. Breaking off from my group and hurrying ahead, two sailors grab the lines, but the lines slip through their hands. Sliding down, the two men disappear. Was it their sense of relief? Their feeling that we're saved? How absurd life is. There is no chance that they will come to the surface again. That moment of heedlessness nullifies the long hours they have struggled to survive. How to overcome this obstacle? Here goes. Grabbing the third sailor from behind and fastening my teeth on his right wrist, I use my teeth to strip off the oil. Got some skin too? Can't be helped. I wind the line a couple of times around his wrist, binding it so tight that blood flows, and call up to the deck, hoist away. To the faces peering down from the deck, I signal by raising my hand. The line is pulled up slowly. One wrist barely supports the weight of one body. Someone seizes hold of his ankle. Lucky him, he's going to be saved. Driven by that thought, and with that man's shoes dangling in front of his eyes, he grabs the foot with both hands. Unlike lines, ankles are easy to hold on to. One wrist is not strong enough to support the weight of two bodies. Together, they lose their hold on the line and fall one atop the other, both gone. That being the situation, I have to raise one person's wrist, pay heed to those directly beneath him, and beat back any arm that comes near. The gleam of tenacity in the eyes looking up at the line. The strength of their will to live. Is it noble? Is it base? Don't get led astray by your thoughts. The sailors must be rescued, as many of them as possible. That is my duty. Wishing to live, they are desperate. Wishing them to live, I too am desperate. This desperate struggle, impossible to avoid. Am I right to exert such effort? Wrong? Has the power to determine who lives and who dies been given to me? I don't know. I just struggle, driven on by something involuntary. Suddenly there are no more sailors. How many have been saved? Only four? The majority have sunk into the water and are gone. My fault. A voice crying, hurry, hurry. Two faces peering down from the deck. The ship slowly begins to move forward. Unexpectedly, in front of my eyes, a rope ladder. It hangs down, twisting. The spot, very close to the stern, is already within the eddies created by the propeller. It is my last, my very last chance. Pitching forward, I grab hold of the ladder. With the second joints of three fingers of each hand, I barely grab hold. The waves beat relentlessly at the lower half of my body. I have no strength left to pull my body up. My physical strength, which until this moment I have used extravagantly, even repeatedly striking several people, is gone on the instant as if it had all been a lie. How wonderful the might of one who has risen above self. For whatever raised me up like that, I am truly grateful. But when I finally try to support myself, how feeble I am. My strength falls away, seems about gone. It falters, as if to test whether I really am attached to life. With half my body about to be carried away by the waves, I fight desperately against my own body. Let go? Shall I let go? Okay. Just unclench my fingers a bit. Let them slide off. That's all it takes. To be at ease, a peace like that of sleep, death. I yearn to be at ease. I'll simply go ahead and die. Ah, how sweet death is. How easy. You can do it. You can do it. Voices of sailors from the deck above, piercing my ears. They have witnessed my entire struggle, shot through with real feeling this encouragement. A voice within me calls, Live! Live! You have come this far. Die and you're quits? Die and you needn't ask anyone's pardon? For the first time, for really the first time, the will to live fills me. It is not a desire that I should like to live. It is an obligation that I must live. Just as my physical body is on the point of dying, my soul finally ignites. With everything stripped away, only that which is truly me remains. Within me, smeared as I am with blood and oil and entwined with the ladder, 
Is this undying flame and this alone? This is the hour of my death, this hour of supreme bliss in which death is vouchsafed me. For this very reason, this is also the hour in which I must make every effort to live. Strong hands grab both my hands. It has been long, the hard struggle on the rope ladder. Moment by moment the choice, battling myself to live, or giving in to myself to die. Two sailors wrest the ladder from my hands, throw me down on the deck. I lie as I fall, lacking even the strength to raise my head. There is only the awareness, permeating my body in its utter exhaustion. No need any longer to support this body of mine with my own hands. Ah, I must have been destined to live. If by chance the sailors had been too hasty in pulling up the rope ladder, my fingers would have slipped right off the rung and everything would have been over. Taking into account my weight and my state of exhaustion, they do it just right. And this at a time when there is still danger of enemy attack, worthy crew members of a battle-seasoned destroyer. The sailors quickly strip off my uniform, turn me face down, stick fingers down my throat, and make me vomit up the oil. Their only question, do you have any valuables, sir? Valuables, mission documents, secret materials relating to personnel, cash, it is a mission leading to certain death, so I carry none of these things. Valuables, no time for such things. They spread a blanket over my naked body. It quickly becomes soaked with the oil that has penetrated to my skin and turns heavy, chilly. Shudders again run violently throughout my body. You've got a head wound, sir. To the sick bay, please. In response to this advice, I raise one hand to my head. The wound from that explosion is fully two fingers wide. Until now it hasn't hurt, so I haven't even noticed it. Fortunately, the wound is to my head, and the bleeding stopped while I was swimming. If by any chance it had been to my neck or body, then for the long time I was in the water there would have been no way of stopping the bleeding. I would surely have died while swimming. When I enter the passageway in search of the sick bay, corpses lie in heaps. There is no place to set my feet, and every few steps I stumble and fall. How fitting that this ship should be Fuyutsuki, hardest fighting of them all. Lying just as I have fallen in exhaustion, I see from one side the face of an officer who rushes past, shoving me out of the way as he goes. Ensign Tanabe, dear school friend, university classmate. That's right. He did become navigation officer in Fuyutsurt. I raise my voice and call to him. He looks me up and down, my whole body smeared with oil, and laughs aloud. You really are a mess. I look at him hurrying past, and I see that he is crawling along the narrow passageway. He himself probably doesn't realise that he is on hands and knees. It's already been twenty or thirty hours of ceaseless activity, with desperate tasks coming one on top of the other. His legs finally will support him no longer. There is no alternative but to crawl, still for him to laugh at how bad I took. I get to the sick bay and they stitch up my wound. Two medical officers wield their scalpels with a determined look. The patient before me in line is a young sailor whose ankle has been torn off. During the operation to amputate below the knee, there are of course no anaesthetics. Perhaps because it hurts so badly, he cries like a baby. When before his eyes the scalpel slices through the bone of his shin like a sharp knife through butter, his crying stops all of a sudden, and his body goes stiff. Had he lost too much blood? The medical officers pick him up, one by the head, one by the legs, and after swinging the body energetically once, twice, heave it up to the top of the mountain of bodies. My operation is easy. They open the wound, wipe away the oil, and sew it up expertly. They say there's almost no danger of infection. They administer some eye medicine that stings. The irritation caused by the oil is acute. To say that the ship smells of blood is an understatement. The deluge of blood reeks. I gag and have difficulty breathing. At his battle station beside the binnacle, Lieutenant Nakata, Fuyutsuki's navigator, had bullets lodge in both forearms. Even though wounded, he carried out his duties until finally he fainted from loss of blood and was carried to the sick bay. He receives emergency first aid and is ordered to rest, but seeing his chance, he escapes and hurries toward the bridge. However, with both arms bandaged, he cannot move freely. They find him halfway up the ladder, passed out again from loss of blood. A good man, twenty-one, with a fine moustache. I hear for the first time of the decision to abandon the mission, that we have been picked up not in preparation for attacking, 
but in preparation for returning home, that our present course is not south-southwest, but east-northeast. Speechless, I chew my lip.